Galatians chapter 5. Hey, we've been talking about um, the Holy Spirit. I don't know how many weeks we've been doing this for now. We've got a few more weeks uh, to go on this. Uh, I hate saying topic because the Holy Spirit's not a topic. Uh, Jesus didn't come down and say, hey, I'm going to give you something that when I leave, I want you to study it out. And his name's the Holy Spirit and you can build doctrines around him and work. You know, he didn't say that. He said, when I go to the Father, he said, I'm going to actually send my spirit to come and my spirit is going to do in and through you what I was doing physically in and through you while I was with you. So to say, to call it a topic is, is kind of weird, but you know what I mean. We've been talking about the person of the Holy Spirit for some time now. And uh, I don't know about you, but uh, it's been really good for me to get refocused back on the very presence of God that dwells within me. Right here, right now, as I'm standing here, I'm standing in front of you, filled with the Holy Spirit in my life. As you're sitting there, uh, listening with your spiritual ears open, not just listening with your natural ears to what is going to come out of the big frontal flaps on the front of this guy's face, but what is it that the Holy Spirit inside of you is going to jump up and down about and thumbs up and amen? And what is he going to highlight to you so that when you walk out of here, you've got something from him, not just something from a preacher, or, or, but, but you've got something from him, not just uh, uh, songs or, or worship, but there's some sort of connection there with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, it's better for you if I go away. It sounds bizarre. How could it be better than be walking with the person of Jesus uh, every day? How better could it be than having Jesus physically standing here right now preaching to us? That would be way better than me standing here preaching to you. But then on the other hand, I wonder whether maybe not because maybe Jesus standing there preaching to you but you not having the Spirit indwelling, maybe you're not quite connecting and getting everything he's got to say. Just like a lot of people in Jesus' time, they didn't get it. What he had to say. Uh, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. And so maybe this is better, me filled with the Spirit speaking to you filled with the Spirit. Maybe it's better than Jesus filled with the Spirit speaking to a bunch of people who are hard of hearing. I don't know. But all I know is this. I'm not 2,000 years ago and Jesus isn't 2,000 years forward, so our paths didn't connect physically. But I'm glad that he said, when I leave you, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit... And my spirit is going to dwell on the inside of you. And that spirit is going to be with you. When, you. when you come to a gathering, the Holy Spirit comes with you. He wasn't waiting for you. You brought him in. Um, when you leave here and you get in your car and you go, the spirit of God is going to go with you. You don't have to go from here and go, I can't wait to come back because that's where the Holy Spirit is. Like in the sort of old covenant, the Old Testament, the spirit dwelt in a, in a temple and people would make the trek and go to the temple but there was only a handful of people that could go into what they called the Holy of Holies and actually have contact with the Holy Spirit and now here we are having that contact all the time at our disposal the Holy Spirit that was in that temple now dwells in us as Paul says in Corinthians I am and you are the temple of God Amen. we're the temple of the Holy Spirit so, so talking about the Holy Spirit for the last couple of months I don't know about you but it's been really good for me just to refocus again. Because what happens when we lose sight of the Holy Spirit, we begin to operate in religion. When we lose sight of the life-giving presence and reality of the Spirit, we try to do the things that Jesus talked about, but we try to do it out of our own strength. And when we're doing it out of our own strength, it becomes religious. It becomes ritual. It becomes form. How many of you know that when you're doing something in your own strength, it's like just banging your head against a brick wall? You're trying to achieve some kind of spiritual reality or an outcome by doing it in your own strength, and nothing happens. But because you don't think of the Holy Spirit or because we're not used to remembering His presence or relying on the Spirit, because we're pretty good, we can do some things ourselves, because we don't rely on Him, we just bang against the wall harder, thinking if I just go harder and more time and more energy and more of me and more effort, then I'll crack the code and the Holy Spirit's over here going, if you would include me in this process... I will help you become who you're meant to become. I will help you achieve what you're meant to achieve. I will help you do the things that Jesus said that he wanted his church to do if you depend on me and journey with me instead of trying to do it on your own. So it's been really good. Maybe I'm the only one excited about this, but 
It's actually been really good to refocus our time, our, our energy and our attention back on the fact that we have the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the Spirit that went into that cave, that tapped that lifeless dead body of Jesus Christ on the toe, sent power and shockwaves through his body and got him up. That Spirit that 2,000 years ago was in that mouldy dark cave is now in your heart, in your life, inside of you. That's amazing. It's amazing. It's something that beggars comprehension on a human level, but it's something that we need to pray. God, give us spiritual discernment to understand that because that truth alone, the truth of his presence with us all the time, has the power and the potential to literally change everything about our life. It has the power and potential to change everything. This week what I want to do is I want to have a look at what we call the fruit of the Spirit. Anyone ever anyone heard of the fruit of the Spirit? <laughs> anyone know the song? I'm not allowed to sing it because it's COVID, but, you know, I'll say it. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. For such there is no law. Boom, boom. Thank you. I do weddings, parties, all kinds of things. Come and see me afterwards. (laughs) The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things there's no law there's no prohibition in god for you operating in love there's no prohibition in god or in the kingdom for you operating in in patience in kindness goodness in gentleness there's no prohibition in the kingdom for you to operate and flow out of those motivations and in those ways the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control who doesn't want that as a part of their story Who doesn't want to operate and move out of those characteristics in their own life? I do. Who who doesn't need more of those characteristics in their own life? I do. And maybe I'm the only one here. But I definitely need more and more of that kind of fruit to cultivate in my world. Because I've got all kinds of things cultivating and bubbling around on the inside of me. Anybody else relate to it? There's all kinds of fruit being produced. There's all kinds of things bubbling around trying to get out, trying to pop on the end of my branches. But this is the stuff that I want popping off the end of my branches. Amen? I want this kind of stuff popping off and flowing through me. Hey, Jesus actually had a lot of things to say about fruit. Anyone, anyone uh, uh, read through the Gospels and pick up that Jesus had quite a few things to say about fruit? fruit here's a couple of things he said that you'll be able to tell a prophet or a teacher by their fruit matthew chapter 7 he said you'll tell them by their fruit not so much by the words coming out of their mouth their their teaching was it is it fanciful or big words or whatever he said you'll know the genuine from the disingenuine you'll understand them by their fruit this is what jesus said Matthew 21, Jesus actually said the kingdom of God will be taken from those who don't produce fruit and it will be given to those who produce good fruit. So the kingdom of God is taken away from people who don't produce fruit and it's given to those who are producing fruit. So he's taking a little bit like I guess the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. The guy that had and did nothing and wasn't producing anything was taken off him and it was given to the guy that had did something with it and produced more. So the kingdom of God is taken away or given based on fruit production in our lives. In John 15 Jesus said if you bear fruit you'll be pruned so that you can produce more fruit. And if you don't bear any fruit he says you'll be cut off. You'll be cut off. Think about that. Uh, if, 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 if you're not bearing any fruit, Jesus said, here's what happens when you don't bear fruit. He said, God will cut you off. The Father's the gardener and he cuts you off. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about one of the things the Holy Spirit does is that he, he places us in this body called the church. Amen? I'm not, I didn't join the church just because I decided one day to do it. Something spiritual took place. The Spirit indwelt me and he placed me in this thing called the body. So he put me in there. I didn't just decide to be in. He put me in there. And, and Jesus says here that the Father actually has the ability, capacity to cut people off the vine if they're not producing any fruit. But you know what he also says, if you are producing fruit, guess what? You're going to get a haircut. You're going to get a trim. You're going to get a trim. So if you are producing fruit, how do I help you produce more fruit? He says, well, I'll trim some stuff off. 
I'll get rid of some things that will help you produce more fruit. Anyone feel like they're getting a trim at the moment? You know, you, you know you're producing fruit. You know you're living for God. You, you're doing what he's telling you to do. But maybe like we were talking about at the start of the service there, that you feel like things are coming against you. And, and, and yeah, I'm doing well, but the reward for doing well is I'm getting pruned. He's cutting more things off me to make more room for life. I wish that wasn't the case. Sometimes people uh, misinterpret the pruning process for God's absence in their world, don't they? I'm doing really well, God. I'm ticking the boxes, Father. I feel like I'm obeying you. I'm, I'm growing spiritually. But life has throwing this at me and that and that. And it feels like you're absent from me. Maybe in some of those moments of life, they're those times where God's not absent from you. He's pruning because you're doing well. He's pruning because you're actually producing fruit. One of Jesus' most pertinent comments about fruit is found in Luke chapter 6. He said this, verse 43 and 44. He said, no good tree bears bad fruit. Nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's interesting that, um, and I'm not preaching on this, but it's interesting how sometimes as Christians, we, we feel like we can't look, we couldn't possibly look at somebody else and make a bit of a call on whether they're genuinely walking with the Lord or not. Anyone feel that? We're told, don't judge. And, and it's completely true. We're not called to judge another person. But, but, but what we need to understand from the Bible is I can't judge your heart, but I can certainly judge some of the things that you do. I can't judge your heart, but I can actually make a judgment call on some of the actions and activities that believers say that they're engaging in and flowing in. Uh, there's nothing unbiblical. In fact, in Luke chapter 6, the two verses that precede what we just read about the good and bad fruit, Jesus says this. He says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Isn't that good advice? Who's ever heard that before? Hey, don't, in other words, don't judge somebody else. You've got your own issues. And it's great advice and it's completely true. But watch what he then goes on and says. He says, How can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. But listen to this. First, take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. That's the prelude to good fruit and bad fruit. What he's saying is this, that it is possible for us, yes, we need to be very careful because sometimes we've got to plank our, our own eye, but he said if you can deal with that and get that out of the way, it is possible to be able to look at the fruit of somebody else's life and go, this fruit's good or this fruit's bad. It's possible. It's not only possible, we have countless biblical examples. I don't want to get into all of them. Paul, uh, Paul hands Hymenaeus and Alexander over to Satan to learn not to blaspheme in 1 Timothy. Jesus says in Matthew 18, if someone sins against you, go to them. If they don't listen, take a couple of other people that have e examined the same behavior and sit down with them and talk to them about it. If they still don't repent, Jesus actually says, bring it to the whole church. Imagine that. We've never done that, and I pray we never have to do that. I don't want to do that. But this is what Jesus is saying. And he said, if they don't want to listen to the whole church and don't believe that that's sin and want to consistently and continuously behave in an unchrist like manner, he actually goes so far as to say, then, then treat them like an unbeliever. Now, by the way, when Jesus says treat someone like an unbeliever, he treated unbelievers with incredible grace, love, and kindness. It doesn't mean that you, you, you hate them. That's never what it meant. What it means is, of course, don't give them positions of leadership, don't give them positions of spiritual authority, uh, and, and so on. It doesn't mean treat them like garbage. Love them just like Jesus did with sinners and so on. And sometimes these scriptures are taken out of perspective and, and out of point. But the point I want to make here is that Jesus said you can actually judge a tree by its fruit. It's possible. We're expected to bear good fruit not bad fruit. There's something about fruit production that Jesus was very uh, focused on and very serious about. Paul actually rebuked Peter for being a hypocrite. Galatians chapter 2, he said, when before I came, uh, um, Peter's sitting down having ham sandwiches with the Gentiles and then when the Jews came, he, wouldn't, he got up and went to another table and said, I don't eat ham. And Paul said, baloney, I saw you eating ham. That's not true. So Paul called him out. 
you can judge by fruit. We need to be very careful of making judgments, but Jesus did say you can actually tell by the fruit that's produced. So here's the thing. The fruit is the result, but the tree is usually the real problem, isn't it? The fruit's just the result. The tree is the issue. The, the, the fruit is not so much... The, 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 the fruit is just... Uh, the fruit tells us a story about the tree. The fruit is what tells us a story about the tree. And I wonder if people look at my life right now and see the fruit. What story is it telling them about the tree? What story would the fruit of my life be telling people about this particular tree right now? Interesting, interesting thought. Now, what is very clear from the teachings of Jesus is that he actually has an expectation that we will produce fruit in our lives. Jesus actually has an expectation that we will produce fruit. Fruit is produced in two areas. One, it's the fruit that's produced through our lives. It's the fruit that's produced through our lives. Uh, you know, Jesus wants us to go into the world and make disciples. Amen, everybody on, on page with that. It's great being in the family of God, but we've got a mission as well. And that mission is to take this 2,000-year-old this story of an actual historical event that took place and make sure that the world never forgets about it because that is the way to God. It's through what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago that we have access to the Father and entry into, into what we would call heaven and eternal life with God. Apart from that, there's no entry. Jesus didn't say, I'm one of the ways, I'm one of the truths, and I'm one of the lives. He said very clearly, I'm the way. No one comes to the Father unless they come through me. Nobody. So there's fruit in terms of making disciples. There's the fruit in our everyday lives of being obedient to the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that the Holy Spirit speaks to you during the day? He communicates with you. He wants to give you uh, 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 answers to questions. He wants to give you direction and guidance. Jesus talked so much about the Holy Spirit. He'll, when he comes, he'll guide you. He'll lead you into truth. He said he'll tell you of things to come. He'll speak of you of things to come. He, 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 all the things that Jesus described about the Spirit were, were things where he was interacting with us as human beings in ways that enabled us to move forward and do and be and produce. And, and, and so there's the, the fruit of, of living an obedient life to the promptings and guidance and leading of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's the fruit of obedience to the Word of God when the Holy Spirit uh, uh, shows us and enlightens the Word of God and shows us what God uh, wants our life to look like and so on. There's that kind of fruit as well. And then there's a second kind of fruit, and that's the fruit that's produced in us. It's the fruit that's produced in us. And that's what we're talking about here in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. That's the fruit that's produced in our lives. The, the other fruit through us is about what we do. The fruit produced in us is about who we are. It's about who we are. And Galatians 5 is speaking about that kind of fruit. So, so, so let me just very quickly go through the fruit of the Spirit and give you a real, real quick um, uh, uh, description of what each of these things are, right? Um, love. It's an undefeatable, unconquerable love that always seeks the good of others regardless of return. It's a love by choice, an act of the will. It's hard for us, but that's easy for the Holy Spirit. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you just don't want to be loving to another human being? Thank you for your honesty, Owen. Thank you. Uh, the rest of you, uh, maybe you've never been there, so this is not related to you. I'm talking to you, Owen. How, you know, you know? It, 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 it's, it's a love by choice. It's a choice that we make. Joy, cheerfulness, gladness and delight. Who needs some cheerfulness, gladness and delight in their life today? Who needs some of that? I need that. I want some cheerfulness, some gladness. Uh, peace. The, the Greek word peace, it literally means a state of rest, quietness and calmness, an absence of inner turmoil. Who needs an absence of inner turmoil in their life right now? Well, this is one of the fruits, what we call the fruit of the Spirit. Patience. The ability, the ability to get revenge, but the choice not to. Owen, you need a bit of that? The ability to get revenge, but the choice not to. A long-enduring temper. Who needs a long-enduring temper? Who finds these days that maybe, you, you know, maybe as you get a bit older, I don't want to stereotype the older people in the room, but um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Owen, for your honesty again. A never-enduring temper. Kindness. Kindness is moral goodness, integrity. Uh, I found one definition of this Greek word kindness. It says the ability to act for the welfare of those who tax your patience. Anyone got people in their world to tax their patience? Yeah. It's the ability to act and do stuff for the welfare and the benefit of that person that's just simply rubbing you the wrong way. Who, wouldn't, who doesn't need that in their life? 
I do. I don't want to repay my enemies bad for bad. I want, to, I want to bless them. Jesus said, bless those who persecute you. Pray for those who mistreat you, misuse you. We've got to act in the opposite spirit to the world. That's what we're called to as believers in Jesus Christ. Goodness. That means uprightness of heart and life, the ability to will and to actually do good. Faithfulness. That word faithfulness in the Greek, it's actually the word pistis, which is actually the exact same word that's translated everywhere else simply as faith. Uh, but what it means in the context of the fruit is that it means that, that we become the kinds of people that other people can have faith in. You're integrous. You do what you say and you say what you do. And there's no gaps in there. People look and go, that's a person of faithfulness. That's a person I can trust. That's a person I can depend upon. Gentleness means balanced in spirit, the ability to control your own passions. How many people need that? How many people need the ability to control their own passions? And then self-control. Self-control means the ability to say no to wrong, yes to right, no matter how strong the temptation, to master your own sensual appetites. Now here's the thing. The Bible refers to these things as the fruit of the Spirit. If you go back a couple of verses earlier, Paul contrasts the fruit of the Spirit with what he calls the works of the flesh or the acts of the flesh. He says the acts of the flesh are obvious. Immorality, adultery, debauchery, there's that word again. Uh, and he goes on with a list of things. And then he goes, but the fruit of the Spirit. So he contrasts one thing called the acts or the works of the flesh. That's stuff we do. That's us. And the other one, he calls it the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. What he's saying is that the fruit of the Spirit is not something that you produce in your own strength. The fruit of the Spirit is not something... You don't look at that list and go, right, okay, I'm going to make the choice now to become more loving. I'm going to, with all the willpower I can muster, I'm going to become a loving person. With all the willpower I can gather, I'm just going to make myself have peace. Anyone decide that I'm just going to make myself have peace? And, I'm, and it works and you just become peaceful because you just decided you are going to make yourself have peace. It doesn't work like that. The word fruit in the Greek, it literally means this. It says that which originates or comes from something, an effect or a result. So the fruit of the Spirit is literally that which originates or comes from something. It's the effect of something else, the result of something else. This word reveals to us that the fruit of the Spirit are the outcome, the effect, the end result of something. So what are they the end result of? If we want to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit in our life, what do these collection of ancient writings tell us? What's Paul getting at in Galatians? What exactly is it that the fruit of the Spirit are the end result of? Well, it's obviously not the end result of human effort or willpower. We've already talked about that. How many of you know how many of you know that there's a battle raging inside of you? And, and, and go back into Galatians 5 and you'll read this battle again, the flesh and, and the spirit, the spirit in you and the flesh and you are battling. There's this conflict zone inside, battling for control. Uh, who's going to have the most influence? Who's going to have the most power? Now, here's the reality. The problem with the self-help movement, and, and this is why Christianity is not a self-help program. How many of you know that? Come to Jesus and help yourself. If you can help yourself, you don't need Jesus. The problem is we can't help ourselves, and that's why we need Jesus. Christianity is not a self-help program. Now, here's what happens in, in, the, in the world of self-help. Here's what, here's what Tony Robbins will tell you to do. And I'm not anti-Tony Robbins, by the way, not picking on the guy, but he's just the classic self-help guru guy. Um, here's the tips. Here's what you need to do. And if you just do all this stuff, then you can overcome this area of your life. Now, let me ask you a question. If, if, if I use my flesh to defeat my flesh, who wins? The flesh is still in control. It still wins. You can't defeat the flesh by using the power of the flesh because at the end of the day, the flesh is still the winner. God wants the spirit within us to become the winner. God wants the Holy Spirit to be the thing in us that trumps the flesh in us. We don't use the flesh to trump the flesh. The flesh is still in control. So we're trying to submit ourselves more to the influence and the authority and the, the, the compelling, the compulsion of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. That's the goal. That's what God wants. That's what we're trying to do. Galatians 5.16 says this. It says, So I say, walk by the Spirit... And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. In other words, if we want to defeat the flesh in our life and we want to win that battle, he says, don't try to beat the flesh. If you want to beat the flesh, don't try to beat the flesh. Just learn to walk in step with the Spirit. Because if you learn to walk in step with the Spirit, the flesh will be defeated. 
because you overcome the flesh by learning to cooperate with and walk with and live with the Holy Spirit. Some people spend their whole life trying to beat the flesh out of themselves. It's not going to work. You don't beat the flesh out of yourself. What you do is you stop focusing on that which you're trying to defeat. Anyone ever ever uh, no, uh, read the stories of, of how the FBI in America, here's what they do. Um, I was talking to a mate of mine many years ago and he told me that, that uh, when you go to be trained as an FBI um, person in, Amer- in, in the States and they, the, 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 whatever the section is that... that finds counterfeit money. I don't know what you call that, but there's a section where they're trained to spot counterfeit and they chase down counterfeiters and so on. Um, and, and when you're being trained about how to, to uh, understand, a, how to recognise a counterfeit bill, you know what they do? They don't even look at a counterfeit bill. They make them study the, the right ones. They make them study the real. That's what they do. They drill them down and they sit in a room and they study the real, study the real, until the real becomes so real to them they can spot a fake a mile away. And it's kind of the same thing with this battle that goes on with flesh and spirit. We, we, we don't want to just keep focusing on all the sins and all the bad stuff and all the evil and all that and think that somehow that's going to make us better because we know what to stay away from. Now, focus on the real people. Get our eyes on the Holy Spirit. Let's get our eyes on God. If we're, if we're focused on what God is saying to us and what God is doing and who God is, then the rest of it kind of takes care of itself. We recognize it easy because we're so focused and we've so studied and we so understand the genuine and the real that the other stuff takes care of itself. The other stuff takes care of itself. We don't need to be drilling down in the flesh trying to beat the flesh. We need to learn to walk in the Spirit. We need to walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5.25, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And that's what we need to learn to do, keep in step with the Spirit. Let me give you the best sort of illustration I can think of about the fruit of the Spirit. Right? If the fruit of the Spirit is not something that you can just make pop off the end of your branches, the fruit of the Spirit is not something that God expects you in your own efforts and abilities to produce. It's a little bit like this. I, I, used, to, I used to go to India on planes, right? We, I used to fly over to India and do things. Now, when I want to go to India, here's what happens. I would go and get my, my you know, passport and my I- injections or I would do all that sort of stuff and then I would have to rock up to the airport in order to get on the plane. I didn't get myself to India. I just had to get on the plane The plane took me to India. Does that make sense? I couldn't get myself to India. I might say I'm going to India. I couldn't get myself to India. My part in the process was just to make sure that I got myself on the plane. If I could get myself on the plane, seated on the plane, the plane would take me to the destination, which was India. And it's the same thing with trying to produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We can't produce the fruit of the Spirit ourselves in our own strength. But there is something that we need to do. There is something that we need to do. It's like getting the passport, getting up, getting in the car, the taxi, getting to the airport and sitting ourselves on the plane, being seated in that place and allowing the plane to take me. There's something we can do, but we don't get ourselves there just in the same way that I didn't get myself to India. I just got myself onto a plane. The plane took me to India. The plane was the thing that got me there. I wanted to get to India, but I was only going to get there in a plane. I'm not going to get to the fruit of the Spirit in my own strength. I'll get there in the Spirit. Does that make sense? I'll get there in the Spirit. I won't get there in my own strength, but I'll get there in the Spirit. Not getting to India. My job was to get on the plane. The plane's job was to get me to India. Well, if the fruit is something that the spirit, if the fruit is something that the spirit produces, and not a work of the flesh, then what is my part? What is the part that we play? Well, John fifteen, Jesus gives us a part that we play in terms of the production of fruit. John chapter fifteen, verse one to six, Jesus says this. He says, "I'm the vine; my Father is the gardener." He says, "He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes." so that it will bear even more fruit. You are clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me. Everybody say, remain in me. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you 
remain in me. Everyone say, remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me, say, remain in me. And I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, there it is again, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Jesus just keeps repeating this phrase, if you want to produce fruit, you have to remain in me. If you want to be fruitful, you've got to remain in me. If you want fruit to pop off the, the, the branches, you've got to remain in me. If you don't remain in me, you won't have any fruit. But if you want to have fruit, you've got to remain in me. I think if Jesus repeats himself five times in a couple of verses, he's trying to get my attention. He's trying to get me to see something. I think he wants me to know that I need to remain in him. Would that be fair to say? Jesus wants these guys to know, here's how you produce fruit. You're not going to produce fruit being out there by yourself. Not the kind of fruit I want you to produce. If you want to produce the fruit I want you to produce, you have to learn to remain in me. Remain in me. That word remain, it literally means this. It means to stay in a given place, to continue, to dwell, to endure, to remain and to stand. We need to remain in a given place. We need to continue in Jesus. We need to dwell in Jesus. We need to endure through the hard times, the ups, the downs, the tough, the good, the bad, the ugly. Remain in Jesus, not popping in, popping out. We've got to get some steel in our back and some resolve in our spirit and go, this is the way I'm going to live my life. I'm going to remain in Jesus. Amen? I'm going to remain in Jesus. Here's our battle. Our battle is not about producing fruit. That's what the Spirit does. My battle is remaining in Him. I've got to fight to remain in Him. Not fight to produce fruit, because if I remain in Him, fruit will happen. Fruit will happen because it's the Holy Spirit that produces the fruit. My battle is not to produce fruit. The fruit is a byproduct of remaining in him. Remaining in Jesus. Remaining in Jesus. If you go back over the last few weeks, there's a common thread here in everything we've been talking about. Ever since we started talking about the Holy Spirit. And this is the common thread. It's about remaining in Him. Remaining connected to God. If you, stay, remain, if you remain in Him, these are the people that learn to hear the voice of God. The ones that remain in Him are the ones who experience His presence in their lives. The ones who remain in him are the ones who operate in miracles, signs and wonders in the supernatural realm. It's the ones who remain in him who become the people they're meant to become. It's the ones who remain in him who achieve in this life whatever it is that God put them here for and plan for them. It's all uh, tied up to this issue of us learning to remain in him. Jesus says people who don't remain in him, they actually wither. He said if you don't remain in me, you're like a branch that withers off. That word means dry up. Anybody have those periods of their life where you know you disconnect yourself from the vine, you're no longer remaining in him, and our spiritual life begins to wither up, begins to dry up. Anyone ever had those experiences in their life? When I'm pressing into God, when I'm remaining in him, that's when my spiritual life is alive. That's when I'm hearing. That's when I'm feeling. That's when I'm getting answers. That's when I'm not uh, living out of this sense of obligation to God. Oh, oh I'm praying because I have to. No, I'm praying because I want to. I'm reading the Bible because I have to. No, I'm reading because I want to. I'm coming to church because I have to. Now I come to gather with you because I want to. All that happens and flows out of those moments where I'm remaining connected to God and I'm in God. Those moments I'm disconnected, all those things become chores and dry. The problem's not the things. It's where I am. Am I remaining in Him or am I popping in and out of Him every now and then? You ever know people like that? They just kind of pop in and out. It's like God's a really important part of my life. Oh, now, no, he's not over here. Oh, he's a bit, bit important. Oh, he's not over here. And we pop in and we pop out of God. And we wonder why our spiritual life never takes us to a place of maturity. We wonder why the fruit of the Spirit don't get cultivated in our world. We wonder why the gifts of the Spirit don't seem to begin to flow. We wonder why uh, our, our, our love relationship with God, our emotional connection with God, it's just dead and flat and we're more excited about a football game than we are about the creator of the universe loving us. And writing our name in that book so that one day we can spend eternity with him. We get more emotionally excited about all these other things. We begin to wither and we begin to dry up. God doesn't want us popping in and out of him. 
That type of person doesn't get very far in their Christian maturity. It's a bit like me when I went to high school. I sort of popped in and out of high school. You know, I, I didn't have a lot of discipline and nobody was watching me too much. So if I didn't want to go to school, I didn't. I'd go to the beach instead. And some days I might go for two periods because I liked them and the rest I'd go down to the milk bar and get some fish and chips or play some video games or whatever. And the end result of that, I failed miserably. I went nowhere academically. Why? Because I just thought I could pop in and out whenever I want. I didn't remain in school. I didn't remain in education. Well, if you don't remain in God, your spiritual life will be exactly like that. You'll be going up, down, up, down. I love, he loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. Jesus said if you want to produce fruit, he said you need to remain in the vine. You need to stay connected to me. And then in verse 7 and 8, Jesus drills down just a little more on that. And here's what he says. Again, he says, if you remain in me, and this time he flips it. Instead of saying, if you remain in me and I remain in you, here's what he says. He says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. If you remain in me and my words remain in you. There's a, there's a practical sense in which us remaining in him and him remaining in us is linked up to the word that he's given to us, dwelling in us and remaining in us as well. You know, it, it, it's amazing how very few Christians these days actually read their Bibles. Isn't it amazing? I'm not saying anybody in this room, I don't know. But it's amazing how many people feel like if somebody sends me a verse of the day on my telephone, that's the word of God for the day and I'm fine with that. And we read it and go, yeah, what an encouraging verse. And we move on the rest of our life. We never engage with that word. We don't remain in that word. We don't get that word to the point where that word begins to remain in us. I'm a big believer. Without, without spending time in God's word, you will never build a strong spiritual life. You won't do it. People say the disciples didn't have a Bible. Well, they did. They had the Old Testament. And they had the living word. They actually had Jesus himself walking with them, teaching them, speaking to them. I don't have that right now. So how do I get to know Jesus? How do I best get to know him? Well, I don't think there's any better way than by connecting with the Holy Spirit and the word of God and me remaining in the words of Jesus and getting to a point where the words of Jesus actually remain in me. I believe without doing that, we'll never produce the fruit in our life that we need to. We'll never become the people we're meant to become because that's the way that Jesus said in 2021, if, if you remain in my word and my word abides in you, uh, he said this, he said, you'll ask whatever you want and I'll, I'll do it for you. Because all of a sudden you're asking out of the motivations of God, not just your own, hey, I want a house and a car and three boats and, uh, you know. No, 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 you're, you're now asking things in accordance with God's will. How did you know God's will? Because I'm getting into God's word. God's word's starting to abide in me and I'm abiding in it. And it's starting to take shape and it's starting to change. See, I believe that to the degree that we abide in the word of God, the word of God is something that the spirit uses to shape us and to mould us. And to help us become the people that Jesus wants us to become. And to be able to do the things that Jesus wants us to do. In John 5, 37, 38, Jesus said this. He said, The Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. He says, You have never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you. Speaking to the Pharisees, his word does not dwell in you, for you don't believe the one he sent. His word doesn't dwell in you. I wonder in this room uh, today, does the word of God dwell in any of us? Is the word of God dwelling on the inside of us? Are we, are we happy to not have the word of God dwelling inside of us? I, I, I'm, I'm genuinely concerned for the younger generation. Any young person in this room, I'm genuinely concerned for the younger generation of Christians coming through because a verse of the day is becoming their meal. One verse a day on a phone. They don't even search for it. They don't pray for it. They're not going to the word of God and saying, Holy Spirit, what do you want to say to me today? No, no, the Holy Spirit must be saying to me what is being mass produced to tens of thousands of people around the world because that's the verse that came up on the algorithm for the computer program. How much better is it when you pick up that book and you read it and all of a sudden, bang, you go, that's, that's the word for me today. That's what God's saying to me today. That's what he wants me to feast on and eat on. I'm going to dwell on that and think about that as I go through my day and so on. Uh, uh, younger people, can I encourage you, if you t don't listen to anything else I have to say, listen to this. Get a Bible. If you, if, you, if you have a Bible, start reading it. Actually start reading it every day. Don't worry about whether you understand it, whether you get it. Let that word get inside of you. You cannot build a strong spiritual life without being in the word of God. It won't happen. It won't happen. So many young people are being discipled by anything but the word of God. 
MTV is discipling them. The words of the, uh, the, all, all the singers who are saying life's like this and this is what the world's about and so on. And that's the stuff that's getting on the inside of young people these days. That's the word that's shaping them. That's what's shaping their worldview. That's what's shaping the next generation of, 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 of Christians. I'm a big believer we need to, 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 to really be, be, be pointing people to the word of God. Point people toward the word of God. It's unchanging. In a world right now where the world out there is telling young people there's nothing solid to stand on, nothing is firm, nothing is unmovable, the world is fluid and everything's changing every day and we can come back and go, hang on, there's something that never changes. The character and nature of God never changes. The word of God never changes. So if you want something to hang your hat on so that you've got some stability in your life, turn to the word of God. Amen? Turn to the Word of God. Have a look. Get in to the Word of God. Hey, our battle is about remaining in Him. And if you're going to remain in Jesus, here's the type of attitude that you're going to have to have. Got that clip there, Luke? We need to have this type of an attitude if we're going to remain in Jesus. That's the battle. Fruit is the byproduct. Watch this guy. He's going to win at all costs. He's going to make it. He's going to make it. Ain't nobody going to stop him from getting across that finish line. And that's the kind of attitude that we have to have in our world if we're going to remain in Jesus. How many of you know the world's screaming at you, the day's screaming at you, everybody's screaming at you, there's so many other things crying for your attention. But Jesus said this, he said, if you remain in me, you'll produce fruit. He said, remaining in me is about remaining in my word. So if you remain in my word, you'll produce fruit. If you don't remain in me and you don't remain in my word, you're not going to produce fruit. And if we're not going to produce fruit, then we're never going to become who God wants us to become. And we're never going to do everything that God wants us to do. At the very last verse there, verse 8, Jesus explains, he wraps the whole thing up and explains, this is why it's so important for you and I to produce fruit in our world. Here's why. He says, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. He says, This is to my Father's glory. I can self-help my way to the fruit of the Spirit, try to anyway. But you know what the problem is with the self-help movement? At the end of the day, who gets the glory? Look what I did. I'll go on the speaking circuit, I'll write books, I'll tell you how wonderful I am because look what I did. And the glory comes to me. Jesus says, it's not about self-help, it's about remaining in me, letting the Spirit do his work. Because when the Spirit does the work, guess who gets the glory? All the glory goes to God for the person you become. All the glory goes to God for the things that you achieve. All glory goes to God for the successes that you have. And that's what being a disciple is all about. We need to produce God's fruit. We need to produce it in God's way. And it needs to be produced ultimately for God's glory. Amen. Father, I want to thank you for this morning. God, thank you for your word, Lord. And God, I, 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 thank, God, I pray for people sitting here right now who, uh, God, maybe have been burnt out trying to be loving and patient and kind and good and faithful and gentle and, and self-controlled. Father, there, are, there, there might be people here who have tried and tried and tried in their own strength and, and feel like they have failed and fallen short and have been unable to achieve it. And God, I, I just pray today, Father, would you set those people free? Would you... Uh, God, liberate them this morning that, God, you're not expecting me to become these things in my own strength. Father, all you're asking me to do is to just hang with you, remain in you, stay connected to you, get into your word. And God, you told me that this fruit is something that the Spirit will produce in my life. Our battle is not to produce the, the fruit, but to stay remaining in you. And God, I pray for those people this morning. I just pray you would liberate them from uh, wrong thinking that they have to make themselves better. We can't make ourselves better, God. That's why we need you. And praise God for the Holy Spirit that you've sent to indwell us and empower us and to change us and to shape us and to mould us. And God, I pray that we would all in this room learn more and more to surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and through our lives, Father, and that we would do it for your glory. And God, I pray as we leave this place today, Father, in the next seven days, would you give us an opportunity to tell somebody about you, God, somebody out there in our community, our neighbours, our friends, the people we work with, go to school with, play sport with. Lord, give us a chance this week to speak to somebody about the goodness of God, somebody out there that doesn't know how good you are and doesn't know how real you are. Give us the chance to step out in faith and to speak to them 
about the goodness of God. And Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen.